Hello, everyone. So, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. The last time I uh, stand up in front of so many people was when I was 14 and playing a triangle in a brass band, so <laughs> it means a lot for me. Uh, my name is uh, Petr Horáček, and I've been working in Red Hat here in Brno for the last four years. Uh, three years on overt, aka Red Hat virtualization, and uh, a year ago I joined a brand new project called uh, Kubvert. And Kubvert is an add-on for Kubernetes that brings uh, virtualization support on top of Kubernetes clusters and allows you to run virtual machines next to your containers. And in this talk, I will tell you about the, our journey of implementing advanced networking solution on top of Kubernetes. Um, by advanced networking, I mean, for instance, a physical device pass-through or, or access to multiple uh, layer two networks from pods or virtual machines. So in this talk, I will tell you about challenges and solutions we came up with. And I will start with cluster network networking evolution. How did the view on uh, connecting your services change with time? And this is important to give you a background or show you the ground we are building our solution on and why is it different for the, our previous pro projects. And the biggest part of this talk will be about so-called four pillars of networking, which is pretty much just a fancy name for the architecture we choose to, uh, to follow. And why should you care about this? I mean, Kubernetes networking is beautiful. It's simple to use for users, and its architecture is pretty neat. As long as you are dealing with the default networking, which is usually an overlay connecting all the pods together. If you need something more uh, advanced, like mentioned physical device pass-through or multiple network connections, it can get a little messy. Um, this is what we are dealing with. And uh, we worked with our community and with other projects to align our set of solutions that are dealing with these problems, and I think the result is pretty good. And I want to ask you to, if you don't have a really good reason to choose a different approach and uh, you completely rewrite it, please don't, or at least use the same API so we can all profit from your work. And finally, I will tell you about the tools we developed. So let's start networking evolution. Uh, in the beginning, in physical ages, let's say you had these four physical machines with their physical necks, and you connected them using physical switches and routers to create one interoutable network. Once that's done, you can run your services on top of it. But maybe you decide on next week that you need a additional connection to another network. So what do you do? You go to your network administrator, which maybe he's grumpy, maybe he doesn't like you, and you beg him on your knees to provide you another switch, another router, a connection, and uh, interface. And it, it, can think, it can take some time and uh, energy from you. Is anyone in here a network administrator, by the way? That's, that's great. Thanks, God. <laughs> Another problem uh, connected to this architecture or approach is that if service A wants to uh, access service B, service A needs to know the IP address of the second machine and then a port on which the second uh, service, the service B, runs in order to access it. And in case the service B moves to another machine, um, service A must be notified that the IP address changed and all of that. So that's, that's another problem connected with this approach. And then we got into virtual ages, and much didn't change. We still have our machines, switches, and routers. The topology is pretty much the same. We just made a virtual machine from a machine, and virtual switch from switch, from switch and so on. Uh, the benefit is that if we decide that we want another network connection, all we need to do is to do a few clicks and get our virtual network uh, up and running. No need to deal with uh, other people. And so then cloud ages came, and the topology is completely different, at least from the user's perspective. Uh, we still have our services, and they are running on, on some machines, but we don't really care about them. We just have a set of nodes, our services, and all these services are connected using a, an overlay network, or a different network that connects all these uh, services together. The difference is that every single service here has its own IP address, and is, uh, so which doesn't change and or can change, but 
the, the point is that service A can access service B just using its IP address. Uh, at least this is a premise of uh, Kubernetes networking. And um, yeah, that's all for Kubernetes networking. But then maybe your service needs a high throughput or access to a storage network. Uh, and how to do this? It's not defined by the Kubernetes network design. You need to somehow connect the, the service to another additional interface and to the storage network. Or maybe you want to use a private network to connect two of your services. Again, you need to invent your own solution for that. Or you need a um, physical device pass-through for SRLV. Again, you need to do it yourself. It's not given to you. But we, we had to deal with these problems because um, these use cases can be useful for containers, but they are really important for virtual machines that we are running. So we came up with our four pillars of networking and uh, our Kubert mantra called Kubert Razor. Uh, if something can be used for pods, it should not be implemented for VMs. So you will understand it uh, pretty soon, I, I hope. So the first column is node network configuration. Then we have logical network definition, smart scheduling, and VM uh, binding mechanism. I will go, go through all of them now. So let's start with the node network configuration. If you need, all you need is just the default Kubernetes network. You can probably uh, just configure it on the day one and use Ansible or shell scripts to configure your overlay or whatnot, and you are done. However, if you want to use uh, physical devices or additional networks, requirements for them change uh, next weeks and month, and you need to dynamic, uh, dynamically configure those. Uh, of course, you can again use Ansible or shell scripts, but that can be tedious. So what we uh, created in Red Hat is something called NM state and um, a Kubernetes NM state. For you who didn't attend uh, NM state presentation on Friday, NM state is a tool that allows you to declaratively uh, define desired network state on a host and then just apply it compared to, for instance, a network manager, which uh, has an um, imperative like, approach to it. And Kubernetes NM state uses NM state on a uh, cluster level. Uh, what that means, um, we created a two, two new uh, Kubernetes objects. First of them is called node network state. The second is node network configuration policy. Node network state is one per each node in your cluster, and it allows you to uh, check what is the state of the network on the host, and also to configure it. And if you want to apply some gener general rules to configure a network uh, on your cluster, you can use node network configuration policy and say, for instance, on every NIC that is SRIOV enabled, uh, enable eight uh, virtual functions. So uh, how can it look like? I mean, you, you have this uh, basic uh, cluster of your nodes, and you add a new switch. So if you want to expose this switch to your pods or VMs, you maybe need to create a bridge below them. So with uh, NM state Kubernetes, you can use uh, the node network sta status to report the ETH1 and check that it's really there. And then you can create a specification that says configure the ETH1 and create the bridge on top of it. I won't go into the details of this, but Trust me. So if you apply this, uh, you get from this, this state, you get into this state, just using kubectl and those uh, objects. So in some cases, you need to do dynamic configuration of your cluster networking, and uh, Kubernetes NM state makes, makes it easier for you. Then the second pillar, logical network definition. For a user, the logical network might be just uh, a symbol a name for a certain connectivity, while for administrator who defines these logical networks, it's a method how to connect a pod into a desired network. And it, this problem wasn't bugging only us, but many people across Kubernetes. So uh, the, some, this, uh, this Kubernetes network custom resource definition de facto standard was created. And you know it, maybe you know it under the name Multos. Just a uh, qu quick intro to Multos. By default, Kubernetes 
uses only the one single network plugin. And so what Multus does, it becomes this one single network uh, plugin, and then it calls the default one, or maybe a second network, maybe the third network, and so on. So what we do here is that when a user creates his, uh, they put their pod, uh, they are connected to the default network. And maybe they requested an additional network, the blue network in this case. They don't care how they are connected. They just want ETH1 interface connected to this network. So based on the logical network definition, they are connected to it using the bridge and maybe some VLAN, but that doesn't matter for the user. User just requires the blue network. It can look like this. This is the definition of the network, network attachment definition called blue network, and it says connect me to OVS bridge, bridge one, and tag it with VLAN 100. And then user just requested it, request it using an annotation. So the second pillar, logical network connectivity, represents um, connectivity to a certain logical network. And uh, in, with Multus and with the de facto standard, we use an uh, object called network attachment definition to do that. Now, the third pillar is scheduling. Cluster nodes in the cluster are not all the same. Some of them may have additional network interfaces, some of them like SRLV. And you need to make sure that when a user requests a connectivity to a network, they are, their pod is scheduled on a node that actually has access to this network. And maybe you can do it using node labels and um, node selectors, but that would be tedious. And again, user doesn't care about uh, the node. They want to get this or that connectivity. So as part of the de facto standard, we have um, scheduling as well. So let's say I have, I'm back to my cluster with my three nodes, and I have a pod that has no special requirements. It can be scheduled on any of these three nodes. But now it requires a blue network. So the first node is out of the game. We need to have access to the blue switch. And then maybe the third node has so many pods connected to this network that the bandwidth is, is gone. We cannot uh, schedule any more pods on there. So it's out of the game too. And we end up with this uh, single node available. So the, the smart scheduling makes sure that this will happen automatically for you. Um, it's done using node resources, but we don't have enough time to get into that. So if you are interesting, che interested, ch uh, check out the slides later. Um, there are two methods how to do it, but they are based on the node resources. In short, you can either use uh, extended resources if you handle unlimited, kind of unlimited resources, or you can use device plugins if, it, uh, if you care about every single uh, connection that is available on the node. For instance, virtual functions of your uh, SRLV card. Um, as I said, it's handled using the de facto standard and Multus, and there is additional annotation in the network attachment definition that says, give me, I want to be scheduled on the uh, node with this resource available in case a port requests this network. Okay, so, um, wrap up for smart scheduling. Kubernetes provides enough tools to uh, implement these scenarios, uh, but it can be tedious to do it yourself. So uh, Multus and the de facto standards glues together the logical network definition and scheduling. Finally, the, the, uh, the fourth pillar, which is the only VM and Kubert specific, uh, is VM binding mechanism. And in Kubert, the VM is just another process running uh, in the cluster, and it's treated as any other pod would be. We, and for the previous three col columns, uh, or pillars, we just consume them. So, um, quick intro to pods and VMs. So, this is a pod, and it's just uh, isolated namespace, network namespace in, in this case. And so as a network namespace, it is ETH0 with connectivity to some outside network. Container, uh, which is part of the pod, is set of another uh, network names, sorry, another na namespaces, but we don't care about them since they are not network related. And in this container, we run our processes. And in the case of Kubert, this process happens to be a virtual machine. 
Unfortunately, or fortunately, a virtual machine has its own network namespace and it's isolated from the ETH0 and cannot see it. And it has its own ETH0. So how do we connect these two and make sure that the virtual machine has access to the outside network? In uh, Kubert, we have uh, two basic mechanisms to do that. The first one is using a Linux bridge. In this case, we, back, back to the plot, we create a bridge connected to the ETH0, which has access to the outside network, but we cannot keep the IP address on the interface. We need to move it inside the virtual machine. So we remove it from ETH0, from pod, create a DHCP server that offers this IP address on the bridge. Then we connect the bridge to the VM. VM runs DH client, re uh, receives this address. And now, as you see, the VM is connected with those tubes directly to the outside network, and it has IP address which originally belonged to the pod. So it, it became the pod from the networking pers perspective. The issue connected with this approach is that if we run additional side, side containers on the pod, they won't have network access since the IP address is missing there. This is how the request would look like in the uh, virtual machine um, definition. And again, it's just we request a pod network and we attach it to the VM using a bridge, uh, bridge mechanism. The second binding option is using net. In this case, uh, we forward only a specific port traffic uh, to the VM, the rest stays in the pod. And that allows us to overcome the problem with side, co side containers. We can just uh, redirect certain traffic to the VM and the rest can be handled by side containers. So again, our uh, disconnected machine, con we connect uh, it to a bridge, so now it has access to the pod network namespace, but not the outside network. Again, we start a DHCP server, but this time we don't offer the IP address, which is uh, address of the pod. Instead, we offer uh, some static IP address. It can be anything. It's just so the virtual machine will obtain a IP address. Finally, the difference here is that we use IP tables uh, to say that if there is a, a traffic coming to the pod and the destination port is 80, it will be forwarded inside the machine. And as I said, thanks to that, we can use sidecars. Now, the virtual machine instance definition would look pretty much the same, at least, except we specify the masquerade binding instead of the bridge. Finally, for Multus and multiple network support in a Kubert, um, we use the same mechanism for every secondary network that is passed to the pod. And those secondary networks are received, like, we ask for them the same way a pod would ask for them, and then we just consume what is given in the pod. The binding process is the same. And it's just an initial interface and an initial network request defining the, the blue network as we see, saw before. To recapitulate, the virtual machine is just another process running inside the cluster. Uh, sorry. And based on the binding mechanism we choose, we get different capabilities and performance. So the takeaway from this presentation, um, the containers or the Kubernetes um, network approach changed the view on networking. Instead of uh, in terms of switches and routers, we think in terms of a connectivity from service A to the service B. And Although it's, it can be hard to run uh, this uh, type of workloads, like a physic, uh, to connect to a physical interface from a pod, it is possible. And I hope you have uh, at, at least some idea which tools to use and how, how it works. And yeah, that's all. Thanks, you for, uh, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions or comments, this is the time. Yes? Um, n not by default. In the, uh, so the question is whether it's possible to uh, attach multiple IP addresses to a single pod. I don't think it's, uh, it's possible by default, and, uh, but you can do it if you configure... Okay, let me rephrase. You configure the networking yourself, or you configure the plugins that uh, give you the networking. So in theory, you could do it, but the question is why would you do it?
like sidecar along with the virtual machine and not uh, uh, having to, to introduce NAS? Yeah, I mean, if you want, uh, if you want to handle it yourself, it's definitely possible. Um, yeah. So this option is not considered currently. Uh, are you talking about the, uh, the? Oh, sorry, what happened there? Are you talking about the secondary connections or the primary network? The primary. Um, I don't think it's possible, or someone does it because there's no need for it. You just need the connectivity from A to B. Does it answer your question? Yes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, so the fastest option uh, I didn't really talk about the binding mechanism was would be the the pass through of. So the question was which uh, which mechanism is the fastest and best, best for performance. The best would be SRV uh, binding, obviously. But then I'm I don't have any data to support it. But I think the bridge option would be. Uh, um, the second one, and then you have the uh, IP tables option when it comes to the secondary networks. Yeah, I just had a follow up on Kubernetes multiple IP addresses. It doesn't actually support multiple IP addresses yet, and the only reason they're getting added is for IPv4, v6 dual stack at the moment. Um, so it's not even possible to do them as a first class citizen in the Kubernetes API yet. That's planned, but it's probably not going to come. There's a uh, Kubernetes extension uh, proposal that's there and is talking about this and being worked through. Uh, but again, at the moment, it's only for V4, V6 dual stack. Hopefully, it can get expanded to um, other use cases in the future. OK, if you didn't hear, just for, and for the recording, <laughs> it's. As for now, the multi multiple addresses are not supported in Kubernetes, but it's in the making. Any other question? Okay, then thank you very much for, for listening, and bye. <laughs>